It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling. And his spirit's burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Good morning and welcome to Noble Park Christian Church. This is my Easter Friday message. Uh, we won't have the normal service as we usually do, but uh, this morning I'm going to speak, of course, on the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and look at some aspects of why Jesus had to come and suffer such a terrible death. Uh, do we understand terms like Jesus being the second man or the last Adam? Is this important for us to understand? Is it important to know what it is to be in Christ? Why, when God created everything so perfectly, did Adam disobey him and bring this disaster uh, upon the, the earth? Did Jesus have to, to come at all? Couldn't God have just forgiven us our sins? So we're going to look at aspects like this and uh, try to understand the nature of the crucifixion and not only that, but also the nature of God's plan for mankind. So sit back and um, try to absorb many of the many scriptures that I'll be presenting today. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I do pray this morning that you would open the eyes of our understanding. Help us to understand your word. Help us to understand your plan of redemption, Lord God. Help us to, to draw closer to Jesus Christ, Lord. Your word says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So we commit this time to you, Lord. Uh, teach us, open the, the, our hearts, open our minds in Jesus' name for your glory. Amen. So let's begin right at the very beginning, uh, looking at Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 13. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. There's a couple of things to observe there. Um, number one, when God asks you a question, he's not looking for information. He knew exactly where Adam was, but Adam was hiding. The first thing that happened when Adam disobeyed God was that he hid from God. And God came looking for him. And... Uh, he asked the question, have you not eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Adam had everything perfect. He was in a perfect environment. He just had to obey one commandment, but he disobeyed. He disobeyed God. And uh, then the blame game starts. God comes to Adam and says, what have you done? It's a woman. It was a woman that you gave me. Adam was... Uh, indirectly blaming God and then of course goes to the woman uh, it was the serpent's fault see what happens the minute sin comes into our lives we start to lie we start to justify ourselves we start to blame other people this is the consequences of that one disobedient act that Adam committed and that was the start of disaster for the human race and it tells us um, very succinctly in Ephesians, just what were the consequences of Adam's fall. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, 
fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. This is what happened to mankind just from that one act of disobedience. Sin came into the world, and through sin, death. And so we need to realize that this was the issue that God was addressing when he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at some passages of scripture that, um, that help us to see that this was prophesied. This didn't take God by surprise. God was not surprised when Adam fell. Why did he create in the first place? Well, that's a mystery. That's a genuine mystery. Why did God create us? I suspect He's such a relational God that he created some beings that through obedience and righteousness and, and love of his son, Jesus Christ, he could have fellowship with us. Now we know that sin spread throughout the face of the whole earth and man did wickedly in the sight of God. And God had to bring the flood. And then when everything was re-established, man sinned wickedly once again and God had to bring the law he instituted the law that would uh, withhold God's wrath from being poured out on the face of the earth and uh, I just want you to listen to this very carefully this passage in Exodus which is to do with the Passover lamb the sacrificial lamb for the sins of the people this is in Exodus chapter 29 verses 38 to 43 now this is what you shall offer on the altar Two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. One lamb shall be an offering in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. With the one lamb shall be one-tenth of an ephah of flour mixed with one-fourth of a hin of pressed oil and one-fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering. And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and you shall offer it with a grain offering and a drink offering as in the morning for a sweet smelling aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you and speak with you. And there I will meet with the children of Israel and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Now God had given very specific instructions as to how sins were to be forgiven. And I want you to uh, have a think about this passage here when we hear about the death of Jesus Christ and the things that took place which represented Jesus Christ as the sacrificial lamb. He had to be there at nine o'clock in the morning for the morning sacrifice and he had to be there in the evening at three o'clock for the evening sacrifice. Now he fulfilled the law to the letter, even to the point of making sure that the morning sacrifice was uh, fulfilled and the evening sacrifice was fulfilled. Uh, it's a lot more involved than that, but just bear those two things in mind for now. And remember that it was a, a sacrifice that was to be continual. Jesus Christ died once for our sins and thereafter never again. He's paid the price for us. So let's, let's remember that. Now when Jesus uh, was born of a virgin, he, he, was, he was not born of Adam. He was the second man. Adam was the first man. Jesus Christ was the second man. He was the last Adam. He was the last man that God was going to deal with in the flesh. From now on, after Jesus rose, God is only going to deal with people in the spirit. So I just want to draw your attention to the time when Jesus came into the, uh, the temple. He'd reached his, his age of 30, so he was entitled to, to preach the word in the temple. And uh, I just want to read this to you, and, and it, it sends goosebumps up my spine. Every time I think about this, I try to picture the situation. So let's, let's read this passage from Luke. So he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, he gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue was fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, here was Jesus saying that the prophecies of Isaiah had been fulfilled and he was the one, the vessel by which God was going to use. And you would think that they would all recognize him as the Messiah, but what did they do? They picked up stones to stone him. Okay, so just, just recapping. When God created, he saw and everything was good. But Adam had one a command to obey, which he failed. And because of that, he became a slave of the enemy. Uh, Romans 6, 16, we're slaves of the one we obey, whether of sin to death or obedience to righteousness. So Adam became a slave to the devil. The keys of the kingdom that God had given to Adam, Adam gave to the devil. And that's why we have so much wickedness in the world today, because of Adam's sin, because of man's wickedness. We now have the knowledge of good and evil. So what we choose is up to us. So, so God had a way, he had a plan um, to redeem mankind, but it wasn't through um, anybody who was a descendant of Adam. This, this man who would redeem us was fully man, yet fully God, sinless. He was not according to the genealogy of Adam. He was born outside the Adamic gene. He was the second man. So why did Jesus have to become a man? Why did the word of God have to become flesh and dwell amongst us as the only begotten son of the father? Uh, please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one. If we are in Christ, we are one with him. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praises to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here I am and the children whom God has given me. He continues in Hebrews 2, 14 to 18. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to the angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things, he had to be made like us, his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Thank God we have a saviour who has experienced everything that we've experienced except without sin. He lived a life for 33 years without sin, spotless before God. He became the spotless Lamb of God that was sacrificed for our sins. So Jesus was the perfect eternal sacrifice for our sins. He died once for our sins. And so let, let us remember that this Easter, when we celebrate, let us remember and go back that 2,000 years to the suffering of Jesus Christ. He suffered for you, he suffered for me. When he hung on that cross, he, he, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even the Jews that were waiting for their Messiah for, for millennia, 
They didn't understand when he came. Let us not make the same mistake. Let us appreciate what Jesus has done for us. Let us give him our lives afresh this day. Let us commit ourselves to him. He holds the keys to death and hell. In the book of Revelation, Again, it, it tells us that this was all planned from before the foundation of the world. In Revelation 13, 8, it says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, slain from the foundation of the world. In Matthew chapter 16, 21 to 23, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offence to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. We need to remember that Jesus did not talk to Peter. He was addressing the devil, the, the lying spirit behind Peter's comment. Jesus is the only person ever born who was born to die. He knew what he came for. He knew what he was doing and he fulfilled the Father's wishes. He lived a spotless life, perfect, fulfilling the, every, every jot and tittle of the law so that he could indeed say that he fulfilled the law. He didn't do away with it. He fulfilled the law so that he could be the second, the second man, the last Adam. So let us remember, when you're eating your Easter eggs and your hot cross buns and wishing each other a good day, let's remember, and, and we should do this every day, remember why Jesus came, what he did for us. His sacrifice was far more than we can ever begin to imagine. You know, when he died on the cross, it says that the temple curtain was rent from top to bottom. Not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. And I believe that curtain was nine inches thick. And God was showing us that the death of Jesus Christ opened the door for us to go directly into the presence of the living God. And when the, the Roman centurion pierced his side and blood spurted out, what was it that caused him to say, truly, this was the Son of God? His pride. But let me tell you something, Sunday's coming. It's pride. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only pride. Sunday's coming. It's pride. He's hanging on the cross, healing forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, 
it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan's just a laugh. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands God, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming.